Okay, uh, this morning we're going to look at uh, uh, everyone involved and uh, um, we are going to begin by watching the screen. Thank you. The video clip begins with Eric Little's dad saying, Eric, you can bring glory to God by peeling a spud if you peel it to perfection. You can bring glory to God by peeling a spud if you peel it to perfection. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Luke chapter 5 and verse 27 is our reading uh, this morning. It will appear on the screen. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi. Uh, elsewhere in the Bible, uh, we know Levi as Matthew. Uh, because I'm not a very bright boy, uh, I will call him Matthew throughout the morning. I know it says Levi in here. I know the difference between the two words. They're spelt different and everything. <laughs> saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting by his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up and left everything and followed him. And then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor. <laughs> but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Everyone involved. We see it uh, every Sunday, every time we come into TVC. Uh, if you go into our website, you'll see uh, these three statements. Everyone welcome, everyone involved, and everyone celebrating. Everybody remembers the first one, uh, and then uh, some of us remember the second one. And if we're really bright and really kind of uh, read the uh, website a lot, or you work here, you remember that the, uh, the third one is celebrating. And uh, everyone welcome, just as they are, we remember that. Uh, but do we remember what the, uh, the other half of everyone is uh, involved is? Can you remember what that sentence is? Let me help you out with the next slide. So everyone involved in the transformation of themselves and each other. Jesus is doing his thing. He's exercising his uh, ministry when he comes across this tax collector. Uh, now, we need to understand that we're not talking about a very respectable man in a suit from HMRC. Uh, this uh, story is a part of uh, Luke's Gospel where Luke uh, just piles on story after story after story about Jesus welcoming in those people who are on the edge of society. So already in this chapter, we are seeing Jesus work with the paralytic, uh, with, uh, and uh, this guy who was a leper. Both people would have found themselves on the edge of society. There would have been all sorts of questions about why they were like they were, and as a consequence, they were uninvited. They were excluded. So, Jesus, uh, so Luke records a, a bunch of stories about uh, the physically excluded, and now he moves on to this story about the socially excluded. Because if you were a tax collector, you weren't a respectable person at all. You were, decided, you were uh, described as a defector or a traitor. Uh, uh, there was this little triplet of sayings, um, of names rather, uh, that kind of gives you an understanding of how they were viewed. You would be a robber, a murderer, or a tax collector. You were kind of, it was all sort of bunched uh, together. Why was this? Well, it was simply this, that you were a Roman middleman. So we need to remember that Jesus is uh, wandering around uh, uh, first century uh, Palestine and basically um, the Romans rule everything. And the Romans will come into an area, they have a look around and think, how much tax could we get out of this? 
And uh, they would have sort of a, a mental note, and they'd think, right, we'll probably get 100,000 in tax. And then what they would do, because they couldn't be bothered to collect it themselves, what they would do is they'd say, anybody fancy collecting some taxes for us? And there would be a few people go, oh, yeah, I'll do that, and I'll do that. And they say, OK, what we want you to do is well, we want you to write on a piece of paper how much you're going to pay us to collect our taxes. And whoever put in the best bid, I mean, it wouldn't have happened today, would it? And uh, whoever put in the best bid got the job. And basically, the Romans said, OK, son, uh, what you need to do is you need to collect a hundred thousand and whatever you make on top of that is yours. Okay, so you can fiddle people, you can diddle them in all sorts of different ways. As long as we get our 100,000, we're good to go. We are good to go. And so tax collectors would uh, uh, collect poll tax and ground tax and income tax and road tax and harbour tax and market tax and vehicle tax and VAT and import and export duties and if you said I can't pay they'd say that's very good news sir let us make you a loan and we'll make you a loan and guess what we'll make the interest rate make Wonga look like a great deal these guys were coining it in and that is why they were grouped together with robbers and murderers. And this is who Matthew is. This is who Levi is. And Jesus comes out from what he's doing and he sees Matthew at his tax booth and he smiles and he gives him a cheeky wink. It's there in the original Greek, trust me. <laughs> and he says, Matthew, follow me. Follow me. Now, I have heard many a great sermon about you know, the uh, immediacy of uh, Matthew's response. Isn't it amazing? Jesus just says, follow me. And off Matthew goes, you know, he just drops all his coins and all his accounts and just follows him. And it's a fantastic story and that's what we ought to be doing. We just need to drop everything and follow Jesus. And like I say, I've heard many a good sermon. As I've read, and as I've got a little older, I wonder whether this is the first encounter between Jesus and Matthew. Is it possible that Matthew has been on the edge of the crowd, bless you, has been on the edge of the crowd, watching what Jesus does, listening to what Jesus Says. If we just go back a few verses, not that it will be on the PowerPoint, but it's here in our Bibles, uh, to verse 15. The news about him spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear, came to be healed. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. Jesus was causing a stink. And people would go for miles to listen to what he had to say and to be healed. Could it be that Matthew is hung around on the edge of the crowds listening to this guy? And when he gets back to his tax booth, when he is sitting there on his own, because let's be honest, he ain't going to have many friends, he sits there in isolation and thinks and reflects on what he's heard about this guy, Jesus. So when Jesus is standing in front of him, perhaps it was the most natural thing in the world for him to accept that invitation. Can you imagine being Matthew? No more of that hassle. No more of trying to work out how you're going to fiddle the next person. How you're going to get to the 100,000 to pay the Romans off. How many people you're going to upset. How many threats you're going to receive that day. Mate, if I was Matthew, I would have accepted Jesus' invitation just to get out of that situation. Now, I don't want to downplay all those wonderful preachers who reminded us of the immediacy of Matthew's response. 
Because this did cost Matthew. We read later on in Luke's story that uh, Peter and James and the other guys, they go back to fishing because they can. But Matthew, he can't go back to tax collecting. Why? Because he's upset a lot of powerful people. Because he's just giving it all up. Taxes aren't being collected. To follow Jesus costs. Matthew follows Jesus. And a changed Matthew returns home and reflects on his day. Reflects on his new friends and his new direction in life. A changed Matthew returns home and reflects on his old friends, his old business. Matthew reflects on his old friends and they're still just that, friends. May, if you're a tax collector, other tax collectors are the only community you know. Matthew sits on the edge of his bed and asks himself a question. What would it take for my old friends to experience Jesus in the way that I have experienced Jesus? How could I get involved in the transformation of myself and others? He's got some options. He's got some options. He knows that Jesus hangs out at the temple. So he could get all his old friends, they could all pile on down to the temple and maybe Jesus would do something amazing and all his friends would come to understand. But, you know, the temple's a bit tricky because there's a dress code, there's protocol, when to stand up, when to sit down. If you were here last week, which court you could go in, which court you couldn't go in. And, oh, the other thing is we are tax collectors, so we're unclean, so we're not allowed to go to the temple anyway, so that's not a very good idea. Well, maybe I should just preach to them myself. Maybe I could get a little box and I could stand up and I could preach like Jesus preached. Except I don't know how to preach. And all my old friends know the real me, so that ain't going to work. Well, maybe I'll just do nothing. Maybe I'll do nothing. Maybe I'll just get on, hang out with Jesus and hope and pray that someone else talks to my friends. No, that just hasn't got integrity. What is it? What is it that I do well? I collect tax. Yeah, that's not going to crack it. Party. I, I am great at parties. Maybe if I had the party and I invited Jesus and my old friends and the disciples could come, maybe in that context they would come to understand and enjoy Jesus as I have. So Jesus uh, and uh, uh, Matthew get together and uh, Matthew says, look, I've got this idea about a a, a great banquet. Um, uh, Would you come? And Jesus says, yeah, 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 I'll come. Yeah, but uh, but, uh, Matthew says, yeah, but you need to understand, if you come to a banquet, if you sit on a table with my friends, you need to understand that in, my, in our culture, it means that there's some mutual acceptance. You accept them as human beings and they accept you. Are you comfortable with that? Jesus says, just get on with it. Just go do your thing. And I'll be there. I'll be there. So Matthew throws a party. And we're told that there are, there's Jesus there and the disciples are there and his old friends are there. A few gate crashes, it says, and others. That's gate crashes. Yeah, it's just like old times. It's just like old times. And conversations spark up. And I guess Matthew is excited. And everything's going brilliantly 
until the religious old Bill turn up. And they complain. And here's, uh, for those Bible geeks amongst us, here is a great word. It's called engognzon. That's the word for complain. Engognzon. And it, it actually it sounds exactly what it means. So they walk through, do you remember Muttley on the cartoons when you were a kid? Yeah? Saga faga Russian surgery dick death. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly what this word means. These people are working around going and they're, they're complaining. They are making it obvious that they do not think that this is appropriate. They complain. They moan. They say this, this is not how it should be done. These people, these people, we wouldn't even let the hem of our garment touch these dirty, foul, murderous, robbing people. This is not how it's done. They confront the disciples, they corner Jesus. And if I was Matthew, I'd be thinking... I knew this was a bad idea. But Jesus, if he had come from South London, he would have said, all right, lads, I got this. And Jesus begins to talk to the Pharisees. Next slide, please. And Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who needs a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Oh, my learned friends, says Jesus, you don't understand. Despite all your reading and knowledge, you don't understand. You don't understand that these people matter. You don't understand that there is no quarantine. It's a new thing that we're doing. It's obvious to us all that the sick need a doctor. The unrighteous know their needs. I am sick. I need help. And I can't help myself. Jesus hears that prayer and reaches out to those who know they are not all that they could be. Whilst the unrighteous righteous look on. And the way Luke writes the story, of course, he paints the picture that it's the Pharisees that are in the real trouble because they cannot see their own need. They cannot get to that place where they acknowledge that they are not the best version of themselves. Conversation finishes. The Pharisees leave gobsmacked. The party continues and conversations between tax collectors and disciples ensue. In the early hours of the morning, the banquet finishes. Everyone's tidying up and Jesus wants to encourage Matthew and says, I love your attitude. This kingdom of God attitude. Matthew As with all my disciples, I want you to take risks. Mate, it's okay to fail. It's okay to get it wrong. This is how we're going to spend our time in the next 19 chapters. He didn't know there was going to be 19 chapters, but you get what I mean. Go for it, Matthew. Don't lose your heart for other people. So friends, as with many of the gospel stories, it begs a question of us. Where do we see ourselves in the story? Where do we see ourselves in the story? Do we see ourselves as the Pharisees, the unrighteous righteous? Those people who, if we stop, and we think for a minute we have just got some unhelpful attitudes about other people 
knocking around in our brains that mean that we speak badly, we act badly. And as we read this story, the penny has dropped and we need to do something about that. Well, we're going to meet around that table in a minute and we can do just that. Or maybe you are a pre-banquet Matthew. Maybe you've kind of been hanging around TBC or hanging around church or hanging around Jesus for a bit. You've been on the edge of the crowd and you've heard some stories and you've seen some amazing things as your friends' lives have changed. Right here, this morning, at TBC, Jesus says to you, come, follow me. Come, follow me. And our communion table is a great place to decide to spend the rest of your life following Jesus. Or maybe your uh, options, Matthew. You're following Jesus. You've got this personal faith. Let me just emphasize personal, not private. Our faith is not private. It may be personal. And you're asking yourself the question, what can I do to be involved in the transformation of myself and others? How can my friends, how can the people that I mix with experience and enjoy Jesus as I have done? Oh, Dave, I couldn't do that. I couldn't start a conversation. I couldn't, I just feel inadequate. Great. We all do. It's not a bad place to start, to be honest. Because it doesn't all depend on us. Oh, God God couldn't use me. I haven't got it all together. Let's be honest. Who has? Matthew didn't. I haven't. I know loads of us here are very aware that we haven't got it all together. What could you do? What could you do? Three women. Maggie Smith. Uh, Maggie Smith, one of our best actors, probably. Actors, actresses. Am I allowed to say actresses still? Yes, I am. Right. Okay. Uh, and uh, do we know the film? The Lady in the Van. Okay. Uh, if you've not watched it and you think, oh, I'd really like to watch this, spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you where it ends. All right? It's a fantastic story. I, I was, uh, I, we've been blessed by um, receiving Netflix from our children. I knew there were some benefits to being a dad. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Julie and I, we've watched uh, stuff. Julie's watched The Crown. She's repenting of that, even as I speak. And uh, we were, were looking for a film to watch the other night, and uh, this uh, film was available, and we started to uh, uh, we started watch it. And it is a fantastic film. Um, uh, next woman, please. Uh, uh, anybody know who that is? That is Anne Naismith. Anne Naismith is the lady in the van. She is the real lady in the van who went to live on Alan Bennett's drive. Anne Naismith was an amazing pianist, a brilliant pianist. She used to talk about music in her body and in her fingertips. And she said at one point that she found playing easier than praying. And she told her minister just that. And her minister, who was an idiot, said to her, and that could be a vent through which the devil could slip through. Ban music from your life. Idiot. Anne was never the same again, really. She never had a happy life, suffered terribly, 
from mental health problems. That which she was great at, she was told that she couldn't use in the work of the kingdom. Rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. Next woman, please. This is Cecily. Cecily is uh, well, Cecily uh, is no longer alive, as you can tell by the uh, age of the picture, probably. Uh, Cecily, this is Cecily as a young girl. Uh, Cecily as a young girl went to a church just like this. Cecily went to a kind of a youth group uh, in a church in South London. And as uh, part of that youth group, uh, Cecily felt that God was calling her to be a nurse. And she prayed, oh, Lord, I can't be a nurse. I don't know what a nurse does. Cecily, I want you to be a nurse. I want you to be a great nurse. So Cecily worked real hard, and she got her qualifications, and she got into nursing college. And as part of nursing in those days, uh, you got stuck straight on the ward, and uh, because you were a young nurse, you got all the rubbish shifts working on the difficult wards. And Cecily found herself working on a cancer ward. And she would spend night after night tending these poor, poor people who, because of the drugs that they were on, their minds were mashed and their personalities changed. And then when the families came to visit, they didn't recognise the person in the bed and it was a, a terrible end. And one night, one of these terrible nights, Cecily was praying, and as she was praying, she just felt God say to her, Cecily, I need you to become a doctor. She said, oh, God, don't be silly. You know, I'm a nurse, and you do, you're either a nurse or you're a doctor. You don't transfer from one to the other. Cecily, I love it if you become a doctor. So Cecily was obedient. She became a doctor. She became a brilliant, brilliant uh, cancer doctor. And she was walking around the wards on another night. And she thought to herself, this. This situation where people struggle as they're dying has got to change. So Cecily dreamt up this idea of a hospital where you could go where your dignity was maintained, where you didn't have loads of different drugs, drugs that altered your personality, where there was support for your family while you were there and after you had gone. Cecily set up the first hospice. She is more commonly known as Dame Cecily Saunders. Dame Cecily Saunders set up the first um, a hospice just up the road from where I used to live in South London. It's called St Christopher's. It's in a place called Sydenham, South London. And in there you'll find her bronze, which looks a little bit like that. And next to the bronze is this plaque that says this. This hospice and all the hospices around the world based on this model, and there are thousands, this hospice is the result of a vision that God gave to Dame Cecily Saunders. And it's wrong. It's wrong. This hospice and the thousand of hospices like it was, uh, is the result of a vision that God gave to a small, insignificant nurse. who asked God, what can I do? What gifts have I got? How can I be involved in the transformation of myself and others? And she heard from God and was obedient to what she was told. Friends, we are responsible for the gifts we have we are responsible for how we use them. But God's not angry if we make mistakes, only if we do nothing. A long time ago, 
a young minister who was a lot thinner than the one you see before you, had an idea about a musical, and it was called The Prodigal. And it was a project that allowed the young people in this church to be involved in the transformation of themselves and others. And whilst we were doing it, I got really worried that this was just a vanity project. And my good friend Steve Ford, who I don't think is here this morning, quoted this verse to me and it stayed with me ever since. It comes from Philemon, this very small book in the New Testament. It simply says this, I pray that as you share your faith, you may come to understand every good thing we have in Christ Jesus. Friends, whatever you're good at, take it. Use it to share this faith which we enjoy. Be transformed. And be, trans be involved in the transformation of the lives around you. Eric Little's dad said, you can bring glory to God by peeling a spud. If you peel it to perfection. Eric, go do what you're good at. Run in God's name and let the world step back and watch and wonder. Thank you.